Hello everyone. Welcome to the guided project on flood mapping. In this project, we're going to build a script that can help you detect floods from images taken before and after floods. So this is a change detection project, but we'll be working with radar data. And radar data is really powerful because it can look through clouds and in cases of natural disasters, where there's a heavy rainfall and there's a lot of cloud cover, this is the only imagery that is can give you information of what's going on in the ground. And you can really use this to rapidly assess the situation and detect which areas might be flooded. So the idea is that we'll build the script together step by step. You can watch me code, listen to my explanation, and then you should go back and try to code this yourself. And that will give you the practice to really work with this kind of data and apply this in a similar situation. So let's get started. We'll first cover the basics of radar data, the Sentinel-1 data, and then we'll dive into the methodology and then coding. So the goal of the project is to take images captured before a flood and after the flood and detect which pixels might be flooded. And since most flood events are caused by heavy rainfall, and as you know, heavy rainfall is often accompanied by heavy cloud cover. So the optical data is not really useful because it can't look through clouds and you can't assess what's the situation on the ground. But SAR data, radar data can penetrate clouds and can give you a clear indication of which areas are flooded even through heavy cloud cover. The data set that we'll be using is Sentinel-1 SAR GRD. Here the Sentinel-1 is the mission name, SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar, and GRD stands for Ground Range Detected. We'll shortly understand these terms in more detail. The Sentinel-1 mission consists of two satellites, the Sentinel-1A and 1B. Uh, they operate this instrument called C-band Synthetic Aperture Radar. And the key feature of this is that it can operate both day and night, and that's why you, so you will see this data captured in both ascending and descending mode. That means it's capturing the data as it's going up in the orbit, capturing that, and when it goes behind uh, Earth, it's capturing data during the descending orbit. So it can capture the data both in ascending and descending orbits day and night. Uh, it can penetrate clouds, as we saw, this is really useful. The spatial resolution of this data is 10 meters. That's a fairly high resolution to really see and detect features on the surface. This is quite useful. People use it to detect ships on the ocean as well as objects uh, on the ground as well. The temporal resolution uh, depends on where you are. It depends on six to 12 days. In most of the APAC countries, it's about 11 days. So there's still fairly good temporal resolution where you get one image every 11 days. Uh, the radar data has kind of operates slightly differently than optical data. So uh, the key thing to know about is that the, uh, the radar data actually transmit pulses of microwave radiation and then detects when those pulses come back. And that gives it an idea of how far away the objects are and what type of objects they're hitting. And don't worry, this microwaves uh, won't cook you from space. These are very low power radiation. And also there's a key difference between how your home microwave operates versus this operates. Uh, the home microwave actually has continuous uh, high power radiation that is operating and that kind of uh, oscillates the, the particles and that gives you the heat versus here you have pulses of radar. It turns it on and off and then it sends those pulses and it's detecting uh, when those pulses come back. And that's the key of how the, the satellite operates. The satellite can be configured to operate in different modes. Here, the pulses that are sent that can be sent in different polarizations. That means the, the waves that the satellite is sending, it could be in a vertical plane or a horizontal plane. And that is called the, the plane of polarization. And it can send the waves in a horizontal plane or a vertical plane, that is H and V, and it can receive either in H and V configuration. And that gives it uh, a four different configurations where the satellite can uh, send and receive the waves in different polarization and then can help you detect different things. And also along with these four modes, the, the sensor itself can be configured to operate in different modes. The most commonly used mode is this uh, mode called IW, which is interferometric interferometric wide swath. And the other modes are extra wide swath. So this is where you have a lower resolution, but you are capturing much larger area. And then strip map, which is a higher resolution, but a smaller region. And uh, most of the world, or most of the time, the satellite is operating this IW mode. 
the products that the satellite generates, there are two levels of products, uh, level one product. One is something called a, a single loop complex. And this one, uh, you can imagine the satellite is capturing the data. The geometry of the capture is a slant geometry. That means some pixels are closer to the satellite, some pixels are far away. So the resolution really differs, but uh, the key of this product is that it contains the phase information. What is the phase shift between the different signals? And that can help you detect uh, really small deviations. Uh, so you can measure the distance very accurately and you can actually, people use this interferometry technique to detect say how much the ground is moved after an earthquake and so on. And the other product that most of the time what we'll be using is the, the ground range detected product. And this product is georeferenced. It's uh, georeferenced to a particular uh, ground, uh, to an ellipsoid, and then all pixels have the same resolution. Uh, and when you do this, you lose the phase information. Uh, but we are interested in the intensity of the radiation, not really what's the phase. And we would want the homogeneous pixels and we'll know uh, what's the, the signal strength at each of those pixels and that can help us detect which pixels are water or not. So we'll be using the GRD product uh, that is generated uh, at, after level one processing. So uh, there are so many different modes for what you need to remember for flood mapping application or for when using this data that most of the world is captured in this IW mode and most of the world is again captured in this BV and VH polarization. So we'll apply those filters on our data and use that data set. But if you are in different parts of the world, you may have additional products available to you. And this maps show you exactly where, what kind of products are available at what frequency and what modes are available here. Now let's see how can we visualize this imagery. The visualization of this data is not very intuitive because what the bands contain is the strength of the signal that return. So the pulses are sent back, it hits the ground most sometimes, it gets reflected back and whatever you receive, that's the intensity of the radiation, that's the band value or that's a pixel value. Now, how do you visualize that? So uh, what you get are these bands like VV, that is the signal sent in the vertical polarization and was received in vertical polarization. And this was the intensity of the signal that came back. And here you can see the areas in the dark, those are the water areas. And since the water surface is smooth, most of the signal gets reflected away and not never received back. So those values are very low versus the white one uh, where the surface is rough, like the urban areas, uh, those get reflect most of the signal back and that appear bright in that image. So you could visualize that one band at a time, like this is the VV band and this is the VH band. Um, you can still see uh, the areas which are low or which could be smooth or which contain a lot of structural information. But a better way to visualize this is that we are able to visualize three bands at a time. And since most of the images have both VV and VH band, uh, you could actually take the ratio of VV and VH and then visualize this RGB composite where you put VV in the red band, VH in the green band, and then VV and VH ratio in the blue band. And this is a very popular visualization technique. This is very useful in detecting flood water. And you can see now the blue areas here, the darker areas, those are the flooded areas. And then you are able to see that much more clearly uh, with this RGB composite like that. And we'll see in our script how to uh, create this visualization. And this is also really useful for visually looking at areas that might be flooded. And this is an example of showing the before and after images of this one particular flood event in Kerala state of India. And you can see here that uh, these are the areas that are, you can visually identify that those areas are uh, flooded here and similarly here as well. Now we can visually see it, but how do we actually detect and identify the pixels and maybe calculate the flooded area? So we'll be following a methodology that is recommended by the UN SPIDER program. This is the disaster management program and they have a methodology that is well tested. Even this, the script that I'm gonna show you has been tested and verified in multiple flood events by people on the ground and it, it really gives good results. So uh, I have linked to this, uh, the document uh, published by UN SPIDER that goes through this methodology uh, in the uh, resources section at the end, but uh, this is essentially the same methodology with uh, just a few minor tweaks. The first step we're gonna do the first script is we have to take the collection, filter it and select the images for before and afterwards. 
and we are going to use the VH band for urban floods. And water can be detected both from the VV band and VH band. VH band is uh, preferred for flooded areas where that could be urban structures. It works better there. If you just want to detect plain water, like an open water area, uh, VV band is uh, more suitable for that. The second step, one of the things that we need to do for radar data is that the radar data contains a lot of the salt and pepper noise, and that's called speckle. So uh, if you just took a simple uh, subtraction of the after and before, you will get a lot of noise. So the first thing we do is we apply a smoothing filter on that, and that's called a speckle filter. We'll apply the speckle filter on both images, and then we'll calculate the difference. Here we are working with the radar data, which is the signal strength. So we'll take a ratio of, um, we'll take a difference between the after image and before image, and we'll uh, see you know, which areas have uh, the largest difference. Uh, once we have the flooded area, that is the initial estimate of the floods, but not all pixels uh, would be valid floods. So we'll apply some masks such as, we'll remove the water that is a permanent water. And we know that you know the permanent water is, or semi-permanent water is that, that's not really considered flood. We also will use the uh, an elevation data to say, uh, we'll remove the pixels that are identified as flood, which are on a slope. And you know, the water won't stay on a slope, it'll just flow away. So if those were detected, we'll remove those. And we'll also remove isolated pixels. Uh, usually we are interested in a, a larger flooded area, not just a single 10 meter pixel that is identified. And most likely that is just a, a misidentification. So we'll apply those criteria, we'll filter it out, and then we'll end up with a much better robust uh, data that we can reliably say this is a flood data and then we'll calculate the area of that so we can know in a particular district or a particular region what uh, area is flooded and we can apply a suitable remedial techniques uh, for that. So that's it. This is the, the resource that I was talking about. There's also a nice uh, guide in the Earth Engine User Guide, a contributed tutorial that can help you go through that. But now we'll dive in and we'll start building our script from uh, step one.